uh, Don, Central Baptist Church in Faith, Texas, our dear pastor Charles Eisen. Brother Eisen and his family have really been hit by sickness, by COVID-19. It seems everything else. I would like for you to pray for them dearly, intercede for them, that God may intervene in all this sickness and help deliver them along with many, many others. Uh, we're so thankful to be healthy today, so thankful to be alive and experiencing the very season in which we're in. As we approach uh, our worship this morning, I would like and invite you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 1, St. Luke, chapter 1. We begin reading in verse 39, and I want to share with you uh, part of a message that uh, I almost uh, hate to say turn there, Luke 1, because I'm going to do really precious little with it today, but I'll tell you the truth. Uh, you should probably have it open, at least, to see that I have chosen for our our text this morning, not even a verse, but just a piece of a verse, and the verse is verse 53, and the phrase which we're going to consider in somewhat a topical message this morning is, he had filled the hungry with good things, verse 53, he had filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he had sent away hungry. Boy, that's, that says a lot. This is known as the Magnificat. Mary's song, uh, upon receiving word and message and confirmation from the Lord Jesus Christ by his spirit of her being the birthmaid of and the mother of Jesus. Verse 39 begins, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And from whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there are there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. His, his, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He has holden his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Heavenly Father, please take these words, these thoughts that you have given me, these truths that you have been planted in my heart, fresh from your word, fresh by your Holy Spirit. Lord, may this human voice, this human mouth be used of you today to share the message you've placed upon our hearts and instilled in us for this very moment. We come to you and we ask for blessing and healing upon our dear pastor and his family, upon so many others that are afflicted with the COVID-19, so many others that are afflicted with depression, so many others that are afflicted with many, many things this time of year. Lord, we know you are the great physician and we come to you at this moment, all together in one heart, one mind, one soul, uh, looking unto you, dear Lord, for all the blessings, all the healings, more than anything, all the love that you give to us in life. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and we pray this in your precious name. Amen and amen. Now, if I were to guess uh, after Christmas through this next week, the one thing that none of us will be suffering from after this week that we have spent in hunger and yet during 
the next few days, you, like me, will have heard or maybe hear these statements, or maybe you make these statements, people saying and welcoming somebody to their home, I hope you have brought your appetite with you. Or, is anybody hungry? Or, I couldn't eat just another thing. Or, so where is everyone on the hungry scale now? These are the kind of things that have been permeating my heart and mind for quite a while and uh, quite wonderful, enjoyable ways. In each case, the question or statement uh, comes up to me in direct uh, relationship, of course, to physical hunger. And that clearly is not on the mind of Mary here in this song that she sings. The circumstances that give rise to it are enough to stir our hearts, I would think, and at the same time, stretch our minds, because it's the announcement that Mary will be the mother of the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that announcement has been made to her in Nazareth by the angel Gabriel. You look back in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38, he makes that announcement. And all of that is contained in the text, although there's some things I haven't read there. That dramatic occurrence, which to a young girl, or perhaps someone who is just a teenager by all uh, advancement we have, it must have been real unsettling as it was amazing and perhaps induced a great joy into her heart. It's no surprise that once this happens, she runs off to visit her cousin Elizabeth, only to discover that what has been a dramatic encounter for her with the angel is confirmed by her cousin and the babe in her womb. And in verses like this, that we read, you'll notice that Elizabeth greeted Mary, and as she did, notice this in verses 26 through 38. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art favored, Highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Notice that now. And we get down here to verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Notice that phrase, filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice, saying, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of, this, of thy womb. And whence is this to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Wow, she's excited about that, and she's humbled by it, you know? And now, just think about this for a moment. How in the world is it that her cousin can say these things? How is it? Well, the answer actually is in the phrase that I deliberately spoke to you about a while ago in verse 41. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice. The work of the Holy Spirit throughout all of the Bible is pointing us in the direction of God. Jesus taught that the very coming of the Holy Spirit would be not to exalt himself, but to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth that he was speaking, right? And so this is the background. This is the circumstance that leads Mary to giving voice to her song, the Magnificat Animina de Dominium. Again, some of you have grown up singing that as well in Latin mass or different religions. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Or in the New English Bible, it says, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Now, I'd like to make just three observations in passing, although hmm, I think I could spend a week there. But it is a biblical song to which you may not immediately respond. Well, you might say, of course it's biblical, but actually that's not what I'm referring to, it just being in the Bible. I'm referring to the fact that this song is steeped in Mary's personal heart Bible, if you would, which was the Old Testament. That's the only Bible they had at this time in history. But it pays deference, if you like, to the song in 1 Samuel chapter 2, you remember, which was Hannah's song. She sang it uh, uh, in praise to the Lord because of the child that she was bringing. And it's making frequent re reference to Old Testament passages. Four of the phrases in this uh, song, and one of the, uh, one, the one that is our phrase, is picked directly out of the book of Psalms. You get your homework done, you can find that. 
This then helps us to get some kind of a picture of Mary herself, how she's doing, how she's feeling. I think we're often tempted to see Mary as sort of <clears throat> something uh, dropping down, someone dropping down out of nowhere, and it all begins right here with this. But of course, she had a life before this. She had a mom and a dad. She was born. She had a background. She, uh, how, how, you know, all of that. How can she sing this song? Well, she must be able to sing this song and use all of the scripture that's in this song because her growing up years had to be filled with the songs of the Old Testament, were filled with the songs of David, that she should be aware of the promise that is rooted in Genesis chapter 3, that she would be aware of the fact that it was through the seed of Abraham that the Messiah would come. And all of that lies at the backdrop of the song here that she sings. It is in a biblical song, but secondly, it's also a personal song. It's uniquely personal. In fact, the first four verses make that very, very clear, don't they? My soul, she says, my spirit looked on me. All generations will call me. He who is mighty has done great things for me. So that there is a uniqueness to this song in terms of the personal engagement with Mary herself. But at the same time, what is personal to her is personal just in a way that is true if you uh, like a general principle of what is true of God and his dealings with men and women. That's my third observation. The song is biblical, yes. The song is uniquely personal, yes. But at the same time, the song is typical. It's typical in a way of the experience every born-again Christian believer has. Otherwise, it would be really no reason for us to sing this song, would it? We would say, well, why would you ever sing this song? Because it is a song about a unique individual in response to the fact that she was going to bear the Messiah. Once we're born again of the, of the grace of God by the blood of Jesus Christ, are we not always also going to be ones who bear the Messiah, the message of the Messiah? Sure we are. Well, you see that it changes from person to person, uh, to from first person at verse 50 to a law. Verse 50 begins to tell us, look here, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. You see that? In other words, she looks back over her shoulder in the song, and when you see her saying, for example, he has shown strength with his arm, you think of him bringing his people out of bondage in the land of Egypt. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones, you think, about the pomposity of Nebuchadnezzar and his great Babylonian empire and how he ends up crawling around in the grass in the, in the back pasture. And she looks forward in the awareness of the fact that generation after generation will be the beneficiaries of the mercies of God. His mercy is known by those who fear him, those who reverence him, who come to him as he has made himself known they come humbly to him. So with these three passing comments, excuse me, let's then come just to the phrase that we've taken for this morning. In verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich men he has sent empty away. First of all, this is the hunger of the human heart. Divine providence like a wheel, and as a wheel revolves, it spoke, uh, that, that that spoke which was highest becomes the lowest, and that which was lowest becomes the highest to the highest place as the wheel turns around. It seems to be one of the works in which God delights to cast down the lofty and to lift up the lowly. He hurls down princes from their thrones and lift up beggars from the dunghill. Every valley, he says, shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, like uh, the lumberjack or the woodsman. With his axe, the providence of God is cutting down the high and goodly trees, the high and goodly cedars, and uh, uh, while making the fruitful trees that will dry and wither to, to flourish and to grow. What is full, God empties, and what is empty, God fills. What is something, he makes to be nothing, Paul tells the Corinthians. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what is nothing, he makes to be something. What is the thought 
uh, uh, to be the wisdom of this world. God makes it to be other foolishness. But base things of this world and things which are despised and things which are ignored, God has chosen so that he may elevate them and crown them with his glory. Now, I'm going to take as our text one example here of general providence of God and use it in reference to, to sinners. Uh, uh, the hungry here are the poorest of the poor. When a man is homeless, he's poor, but he may still have something in his in his wallet, his checkbook, or his pocket to which to supply maybe just his present need, just a snack or so. But when a man is penniless, he's certainly poor. Yet he might have uh, something in there to satisfy the cravings of his hunger, but before the time comes for another meal, he may be able to find something. But when the hour has passed in which he should have eaten and refreshed himself, he's literally hungry. I mean, he's hungry by then. And uh, they're brought down to poverty, but yet by some means of other or one another, they're able to get their daily meat supply. People stop and give them things. People help them out. But the hungry man is worse off, and he represents the lowest degree of spiritual poverty. When a man has lost all his former treasures of self-righteousness, when he has no merits, no strength, no might whatsoever, when he is entirely empty and his soul craves for that which cannot find itself, which cannot find in himself, nor earn by himself, nor by any possibility somehow procure it by his own merit or power, then the man, that man is in the lowest state of spiritual destitution. And when he's brought to that state, then he may expect, in his experience, but only then, the fulfillment of the first part of our text, he has filled the hungry with good things. Amen. This is a hunger of the human heart. This is a hunger in the Bible. The word heart and the word soul often uh, work in the same way. Is used not of that muscle that's pounding away now just down in the depths of your chest, but it's the control center of our very being. So that it involves both our minds, our intellect, our soul, our emotions, and our will. And it be, it's because of that that the heart is used by way of exhortation in terms of our response to God. So, for example, in Proverbs chapter 4, the writer, writer tells us here over Proverbs chapter 4, I believe it's uh, verse uh, 23. Yeah, verse 23. Then thou shalt walk, no, verse 4, 23, excuse me. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of that heart, the issues of life, the thinking portion, the issues of life, the, 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 the going about and everything. So this is what he's talking about. The writer says this, um, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the springs of life, all the issues of life. Now, clearly, that's not a reference to the heart in our chest cavity, but it's a reference to the fact that the very epicenter of our being, the very soul of man made for God, made for the inhabitation of God within us, is to be guarded, is to be kept, is to be noticed and notified. Now, the phraseology that I said emerges from the Psalms, our phrase here comes from Psalm 107, 107 verse 9. Uh, the psalmist says, he satisfies the longing of the soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. So we presume that Mary, as she sings out, she's singing out to the Lord. So what would she sing back other than what she knows of the Lord, which is at that time, the Old Testament scriptures. Again, she's known them from her childhood. He's the one that satisfies the longings of her heart. He's the one that fills those who are hungry with good things. And the surrounding context is a picture of the human condition that man and wom women wander, as it were, in desert spaces. It's a picture of people without Christ. It's a people, picture of people without any real life, any notice or any uh, reason for being here, any wonder of why, uh, where I'm going, where I've been, anything like that. It's a start uh, like a, of a movie. You know, where there's a very, very long lens and it's a wide lens, too. And there's vastness of the terrain out there. And there's just really a speck or two of humanity in it. And as it stays on that long zoom lens, you just have the sense of the vastness of everything and the tininess of the people. And you're saying to yourself, I wonder where they're going. I wonder who they are, where they come from, all this stuff. 
and I wonder if they know where they're going. And here in the Psalms, he says, and they don't know where they're going. They're wandering here and there and everywhere. They're like, if you would, the dedicated follower of fashion. Uh, so it comes out of a song way back in the 60s that he flits from shop to shop just like a butterfly, looking in the hope that he'll finally find something or someone. A wanderer, a hungry person, a thirsty person, a restless person. That's the picture that is the backdrop here. And in the context of that, the psalmist says what Mary now says, he fills the hungry with good things. Now, that's all we need to say on that. We could belabor it, but we got we got to go on. What we're dealing here is the hunger of the heart, the hunger uh, of the heart. And anybody who has lived any length of time at all will have at least an inkling of what is referenced here in the scriptures. The second thing to say is that this hunger of the heart is a hunger that only God can satisfy. Only God himself can satisfy this hunger. The restlessness can only be satisfied in him. The, 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 the lack of hope, the lack of peace, the lack of joy can only be satisfied by him. Remember, St. Augustine said, Oh God, our hearts are restless, restless until they find their rest in you. Now, what he's saying here is that what, what I'm saying, not only can God satisfy the hunger of our hearts, it, he's the only one that can. He's the only one that can satisfy any of our hearts. And if that's the case, why is it that men and women aware of that hunger, being told that God is able in himself and only in himself to satisfy that hunger, why is it that men and women are not turning in droves in, in great company to God to say, oh, God, satisfy the longings of my heart? Well, the answer to that, the short answer is that our hearts are diseased. Diseased, I tell you. Our hearts are actually, from our birth, antagonistic to God. We have inherited the fallen nature, sin of Adam and Eve. Our natural thoughts and desires are not for him or to him or to submit to him or to honor him or even believe in him. But like Adam and Eve in the garden, we've chosen our way. We choose our way to believe the lie, to go our way, to seek satisfaction in everything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Our eyes are blinded, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, by the evil one. John also says it in 1 John 2 and 11. Now, you may not actually accept that, but I think you should be prepared to recognize that if you don't want to look into your own heart, but to look around you. You'll see that this is the story of the 21st century America, Western Hemisphere, the attempt that is being made on a daily basis by men and women, by young people, boys and girls, to satisfy our longings, our cravings, our intense desires, you see, with everything but God himself. To satisfy our longings with everything but God himself. For example, we say, if I relationship with her or with him, oh, that would satisfy my longings. Well, I was married for 34 years and, my, and with my wife in a relationship before the Lord took her home. And uh, if you were uh, able to contact her and check with her, you know, she'd be able to tell you categorically that I do not have any capacity whatsoever to satisfy the longings of her heart. There's no marriage, no person in marriage, no relationship that will fill that hunger. There's no career that can do it. I'm telling you, there's no profession. There's no academic advancement that can do it. No travel log or, or, or adventure around the world that could take to every place that is known and no one's ever been that will satisfy the hunger of the human heart because only God can satisfy it. Only God. It's been 20 years now since a man named David Myers, David Myers wrote his book called The American Paradox, which has a subtitle called Spiritual Hunger in the Age of Plenty. He wasn't writing a religious book. He's a sociologist, a psychologist, and he's observing at the end of the last millennium and at the threshold of the 21st century, if you would, the nature of things. And he's identifying the fact that in the midst of all the plenty 
that is represented in our nation, there is an essential, evident spiritual hunger. David Wells, our friend, commenting on that in a most helpful way, points out how this has particular application to young people, to those who attend college, who found, now find themselves unemployed. They're all around us. Some of them are present with us. And yet if you talk to them, they're often baffled by the sense of emptiness that they feel. I thought if I could go there, I thought if I could be at that school and have credentials from that school, that would be it. I thought if I could graduate from there, that would be it. I thought if I got the job in that place with that group, that career, that would be it. Baffled by a sense of emptiness. Their self-esteem is high, but their real self is empty. They want to be accepted, and yet they feel themselves to be totally alienated. They're more connected to more people through the internet than any time anyone else has ever been connected, and yet they have never felt more lonely. They've got more than any other generation has, and yet they're so unhappy. There seems to be no cause for that unhappiness. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory that he wrote observes that in that dilemma, men and women in seeking to satisfy themselves with what he says, it's a long time ago, with drink and with sex and with ambition, he says, in our endeavor to fill that vacuum in that way, we are far too easily pleased. He's essentially saying we're going for the soft options to try and take care of a real hard and bad dilemma. They sold out too cheap. We sell out too cheap and, uh, and settle for cheap imitations of real living, cheap imitations of real scripture, cheap imitations of real salvation and real repentance and real belief in a real biblical Christ that can save and not just give us uh, 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 some things that the other people promise. In his illustration, he said, we're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a vacation or a holiday at the sea. This, the child says, will do. I'm satisfied with this. And they sell out too cheap. So what? So what? We're caught in the devil's bargain, to quote Johnny Mitchell, or Joni Mitchell again from uh, her book, The Woodstock. What is that? Well, believing the lie that what God wants us to do is going to deprive us, that the Bible is somehow another set up uh, so that if you get into it, it'll squeeze you down. It'll close you out. It will end your existence. And that's what a whole generation has been taught by people that come from that generation who just would not allow themselves, would not allow the Spirit of God to deal with them. And they were like the rich. God sent away hungry because they would not accept, would not believe Christ. That was the lie in the garden. God doesn't want you to have this, Satan said. God's trying to trick you. He's depriving you. Can't you have every tree in the garden? Yeah. Did God really say all that? No, he wasn't. It was the perfect plan of God. He fills the hungry with good things, and he's the only one who does. Here, let me just share a final quote from C.S. Lewis for now. This form is from his book, Pilgrim's Regress. I never saw this before, but you'll have to think with, with me about thinking this now. What does, not, what does not satisfy, he says, when we find it, was nothing when we were desiring. What does not satisfy when we find it was not the real thing we were desiring. We thought that was what it was, but when we got it, we came to realize it wasn't. It's the same thing that he does when he talks about thinking about going back to a place that was very precious to us. Oh, I wish I could go back to those days. I wish I could go back there in the good old days and the good old places. I wish I could go back there where we used to live. And you know what? He's the only one that does. So it's the hunger of the human heart. God's the only one who can feel that hunger. And thirdly and finally, only in Jesus. Only in Jesus do we find the answer to our deepest desires, our deepest thoughts, our deepest longings. What do you long for? 
It's a good word, long for it. It's almost onomatopoeic, you say. This, there's a word in German that actually, uh, I found the definition is, it does not translate into a single word in English. And, and the word in, in German is Sanchot. Now, you're going to check out my German on there anyway. That's just uh, to devour any notion, you know, I'm speaking out of a vast knowledge of German. But the word is Sancho, and this is what it is. It is an eter internal longing, an internal craving, yearning, intensely missing, and try as you may, you can't satisfy that longing by your own self, within your own self. You need help. Really, you need grace, the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never, ever, ever be able to satisfy that longing on your own. Never will. At a very, very mundane and trivial level, we could honestly say that if we never heard a notion of that or had a notion of that word, surely the few days after Christmas and in prospect of the new year are ideal territory for dis discovering the reality of this. Think about it. At a very mundane, small level, you see, we may already feel robbed by the fact that Christmas is come and gone, over and gone so fast, and all of that endeavor to get to it, all of that excitement about it, and all the joy and uh, frivolity around it, now we're left with ribbons and wrappings and returns, happy memories, true. But why did Christmas come and go so quickly? Was it something we said? How did it come and just slipped out and was gone? Our good friend Sinclair Ferguson is honest enough in one of his books to identify this very issue in his own life. Growing up in Glasgow, Scotland, on the night of Christmas Day, when all the festivities were over, he writes, and when it was time for bed, I used to get my presents and the paper wrapped and wrap them up again in hope that the magic of the day would last until tomorrow, the 26th of December. But it never does, because that's not where the magic is. The magic, as C.S. Lewis says, is the deeper magic from before the dawn of time, the deeper magic of God himself in eternity, God in the Trinity in eternity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in eternity, and you and I written on the heart and the mind and the hand of God. He knew us before he turned back in eternity before the world was ever created. That's how God thinks of us. That's how God loves us. And that's how God wants to bring to the hungry those good things. We remember we said that the issue is that our hearts are diseased. The good news is that God is in the business of heart transplants. And in that God is in his grace, busy at this, and does this through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his word through the work of the Spirit, the uh, Holy Spirit working in us. Well, uh, uh, how, how could that happen? How does that happen? Let me tell you. You may have been brought up within the framework of Christianity. You may have only recently maybe come around these things, but in either case, you find that you are able to sit, as it were, aloof somewhat to all the teachings and preachings and songs and, and joy of Christianity. You perhaps, maybe, maybe you want to affirm your belief in the Bible. Well, the devils believe in the Word of God. That's not a belief that has resulted in your interaction with the Bible in such a way that you have submitted to it as truth from God, God breathed, and that you have identified this message that it's for you, and the Spirit of God has taken that message into your heart to show you, to reveal to you that you're lost, and there's nothing you can do about it except come to Christ, and you've trusted Christ. No, you see, what needs to happen is that God has to do something, and God is the one to look to who took the initiative with Mary, and God is the one who takes the initiative with each of us. That is what he does. First of all, he illumines our minds. He brings our consciousness to the effect. Your laws. He opens our spiritual eyes so that passages that 
we may have heard and known for hundreds of years that we've only just discovered, but could make no sense of it all, suddenly they come to life. Do you just get you a notion of that? Did you just get you a, 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 a brain squeal? No, God does that. By his spirit takes that word and illumines our minds by the truth of the gospel that we no longer need to try and work our way up to some acceptance with God because as we've sung already, there is in Christ a righteousness which is credited to us through faith. I'm glad Brother Robert is saying, open my eyes that I may see. Amen? So he illumines my mind through the truth of the gospel. He then comes and sets me free from the bondage of my own heart, my own sinful endeavors, my own guilt, my own shame, my own uh, arrogance that I don't need anybody. He washes clean my inordinate affections and inwardly then he motivates me. He moves me to call on God. I cannot call on God except God the Spirit give it to me. And he said, whosoever shall call upon him shall be saved. Hallelujah to God. He motivates me to live in the light of the truth of his word, to, to hunger for that word, to hunger for those good things. And he gives me good things through that word. Amen. And I'm telling you to discover that his law is actually for me in Christ, a pathway to freedom rather than bondage. I've heard all the life. Oh, he just tells, tells you them commandments to hold you back. No, yes, there are boundaries to keep us from evil, but there are also blessings that God wants to give us and keep us safe for these good things. In other words, he works in such a way that I might love what he loves. I might be hurt by what hurts him. I might be offended by what offended him. You see, that actually does sound a bit like a transplant, doesn't it? It almost sounds like a whole new birth. Well, that's what it is, a whole new birth. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, let's just cut to the chase, boy. Unless a man is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's something that God does. Now, Brother Robert and him sang this morning, and uh, I want to know if you sang along with him, and did you mean it when you sang along with him? Open my eyes that I might see. God responds to our cries in that way. He responds to our cries when we're honest enough, humble enough, hungry enough to acknowledge that's God speaking to me. You know, that's the real issue. With this, I close. Hunger is the indispensable condition of spiritual blessing. Hunger is. Hunger. Those who have no consciousness of need, those who are complacent, satisfied with the way they are, think there's nothing else, who respond and say, oh, I just ain't hungry. You know what? That verse says he sends them away. I could go on forever on that too, but God won't let me. He fills the hungry and sends the rich away empty. That's not a comment on the amount of money in your bank balance. It's a picture of the notion of I am self-sufficient. I made it my way. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. It's a picture of the notion of complacency. So the person says, no, I'm fine. Leave me alone. I'm going to go and continue to chase my dreams. Thank you for sharing with this with me. I realize that you have a very strong view on this preacher, that this hunger of the human heart is answered solely in God in that he does this through the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, by the work of the Holy Spirit in his word. I get all of that, and thank you very much. Maybe I'll see you again next year. I'm just not hungry right now. This morning, is there anybody hungry? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Fascinating. Really, isn't it? Bread and water, not actually luxury items, no essentials for living and actually essentials for dying to. Anybody hungry? And a final word I'd like to say to children this morning who sat through all of that that I, I tried to understand 
and said, Luke, I tried to understand at least some of it. I hope you did. I think you probably got the part about our friend wanting to rewrap his Christmas presents because no matter if you got the thing you wanted, deep down you will say, oh dear, why? Why? After Christmas, after getting all this stuff, after all the joy and the party and everything, why do I feel the way I do? Because the thing that you really wanted, you see, that you thought would make you really, really happy, it can't do that. It just cannot. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to say to Jesus, Jesus, I just heard and I'm thinking I've, I, I want to, I'm the only, I know you're the only one that can make me really happy, give me joy. You're the only one who can feel that need in my heart. I want you to come and do that for me. I want you to come and live in me. I don't know why I'm saying this, but the only reason I know that is, God, I feel like you're actually calling me to call on you. And Lord, I, I, I really believe, God, you're opening my eyes. You can do that. You can go home in the car. Tell your mom, that's what I'm doing today. George Whitefield in his journals many years ago writes on Christmas Eve, if there is only one soul who will trust in Christ tomorrow, then and only then will it be a happy Christmas indeed. Well, who knows? I appreciate you hearing the word of God this, this morning. Father, thank you now that your word is fixed in the heavens. Thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who promises to receive whosoever shall come unto him in trust. Grant, dear Lord, today that we might do that, from the youngest to the oldest, whoever we are, wherever we are in this panorama of life. Please, Lord, fulfill your purpose. I know your word will not return void unto you. Make today just the most important of days for some of us who need it bad. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one today who believes now and forevermore. God bless you and amen. Brother Robert. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren bed. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Pull me without the full bread. Bread of heaven.